but i want you to make him welcome he he blessed our hearts today and i know that he's going to bless our hearts again tonight make him welcome if you will dr stanford lindsay god bless you praise god and good evening friends well, am, I, am i on that's the next question am i on good evening friends better huh praise the lord what a delight to be back here in the house of god tonight the lord certainly moved with us this morning didn't he grand service this morning five came forward manifested the spirit that's a good meeting isn't it now we're more interested in what you do five ten years down the line than what just happens here during the meetings what you're going to do with it some folks get the baptism speak with tongues and never do a thing now we don't want that to happen we want you to go on and do something for god yes. now another thing about christianity do you like to have experiences yes. or are you just content to be a couch potato and do nothing if you want experiences get involved with the spirit of god and do what god leads you to do that's when the christian life becomes alive and becomes real that's why we accept challenges as they come it challenges us to do something keeps us alive amen and so you begin to think that way as well now if you have not yet received your baptism of the spirit that's an experience you should desire then you put yourself to it and of course you will receive hallelujah and so this is just the beginning of things you have not finally arrived at a goal no this is a doorway that you enter into now you will notice if you paid attention this morning we exhorted people to use their faith and move into the experience some people come and then they get in a meditative state of mind and are waiting on god to do something that's never the way to move by faith faith means action if you say you have faith that means you do something you faith it you do it you take action you become active now that's the way faith works if you sit quiet and do nothing you'll never do anything i mean that's not faith faith takes action and another thing we find that people come to god as they are you never wait till you attain a certain plateau of perfectionism no now, if they did that we could all close the door and go home now god takes us where he finds us saves us and fills us and then we go from that point <clears throat> i've always had the feeling <clears throat> or the idea that if we could communicate properly and people could understand what we're talking about it would be just a lot easier to get the gospel out it is said that when a speaker speaks he probably speaks three messages all at once first he tells you what he thinks he's telling you <clears throat> secondly you hear what you think he's telling you then there may be actually what is being said you say because of the filters we have on we filter out a lot of things for example if something you know something traumatic would happen here tonight in the auditorium say if the bomb dropped or something i don't know how many people are here but there would be probably that many ideas of what actually happened because we all think different we see different and to bear this out talking about communication what goes on in the minds of people when something happens it is said that toward the end of world war ii traveling in a train in southern germany was one of our army generals and his aide a bright young lieutenant riding along in the same compartment with them was a beautiful german girl 18 years of age and her mother now we're talking about what goes on in the minds of people they were riding along no one was saying anything of course communication barrier language at one point the train entered a tunnel which meant there was immediate blackout after being in the blackout just a few moments there was heard the sound of a loud kiss followed by a horrendous slap what do you think went on in the minds of those people traveling there in the dark the mother over there thinks to herself what nerve the 
that young American lieutenant thinks he can kiss my daughter and get away with it, good for her, she slapped him. The 18-year-old girl sitting in the dark thought to herself, nice try, he missed, he must have kissed mother, no wonder he got slapped. <laughs> the general sitting there in the dark thought to himself, I don't blame the lieutenant for kissing the girl, but it's a deuce of a note that I have to get slapped for it. <laughs> When actually what happened was, when the train entered the tunnel, the lieutenant saw a golden opportunity. He kissed the back of his hand and hauled off and slapped the general. <laughs> so it's amazing what people think when things happen, isn't it? <laughs> Now, every night I will be answering particular questions. Tomorrow night I'll, I'll be ask, answering the question, when a, spirit, when a person speaks in tongues, does the Holy Spirit speak through the person? Don't miss it. Does it have to be a coherent or articulate language? And how do you know? Say, this is worth your money tomorrow night alone. Don't miss this. Is gibberish ever spoken? How can you tell? Tuesday night, I'll be answering the question, is it possible for a person to get a wrong experience, a counterfeit tongues? Is that a possibility? Now, I don't know what you know, but we're going to tell you the truth. Tuesday night, don't miss it. Now, Wednesday night is going to be a good one. It always is because this is a sermon I always preach on Wednesday night because I leave town on Thursday morning. <laughs> you can't get at me then. I'm going to answer the question... What is holiness? Now, we all come out of various holiness churches, and we are a holiness church ourselves. I sometimes think we don't know what holiness is. Somebody said, well, it means you don't drink, smoke, chew, nor go to movies. I think that's a rather shallow view. There are people in the world on a diet kick who don't eat, drink, smoke, chew, nor go to movies. Not because they're holy, just because they got good sense. Thank you. If I do that, that's right. So we're going to discuss that Sunday night, now, on Wednesday night. Now, Wednesday night, I'll be discussing the subject, Why Speak with Tongues? I'll be dealing with this from a psychological point of view. What are members of the psychiatric and medical professions saying about this subject? If you've got friends or relatives in the nursing or medical professions, invite them. We found they've been interested to hear what we have to say concerning uh, these messages. Now tonight, at, the cl at my closing story tonight, I'm going to tell you about the story of the, battles, the Battle of the Coral Sea in which our ship, the USS Lexington, was sunk. I was there. I saw it. Tomorrow night, I'm going to tell you about the Battle of Midway when the Japanese bombed and sank the USS Yorktown. I was aboard when it sank. I'm going to tell you that story. Wednesday, uh, Tuesday night, I'm going to tell you the story of a man who got saved in USS Portland before it was sunk, just before it was sunk. God's moved in a mighty way, in a marvelous way. Don't miss these. If you have friends, veterans, or others, invite them to the services. They'll certainly be interested in these stories. We have books and tapes in the foyer. You'll want to avail yourself of them. And what we're saying in these services are on, is in the book are on the tapes and in the books. You'll be interested in seeing them. Our Heavenly Father, we come together tonight in the name of Jesus. We pray you'll bless us as we think in your word, give us understanding of it, and fill your people with the Holy Spirit and heal in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
One reading says they begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them this ability to speak out. One reading says they begin to speak in other languages as the Holy Spirit prompted them to speak. Now, if you understand the English language, the Holy Spirit did not do the talking here. He simply prompted them, nudged them, urged them that they could do it, but they spoke with tongues. That's what the word says. And I get amazed at some of our people who think that when the day of Pentecost came, all of a sudden, kabloom, the whole thing happened, they're all shouting in tongues. I don't believe that at all. I believe when the day finally came here, it says they began to speak with other tongues. I believe they were in a worship service down in the temple area. And as they worshiped, the Spirit of God began to move. I think they uttered a tongue. They kept worshiping another tongue. They kept worshiping, worshiping until finally they are worshiping in tongues. I believe that. That's a more normal way of things happening. <clears throat> so they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In verse 1 it says, they were all with one accord in one place. Now that does not necessarily mean that they all had exactly the same mind on what was going on. I'm amazed at people who think God can't bless this church unless we're in 100% accord. I don't believe this says that at all. I don't believe God with withhold, will withhold his blessings from those who want revival just because one or two people don't enter in. I don't believe that at all. I believe God will bless the people who enter in. When it says they were in one accord, it simply means they were all together in one place. That's all it says here, and some of the other versions uh, say it that way. Now, I brought to your attention this morning how that, in the Old Testament era, it appeared God was a respecter of people in that he did not give the Holy Spirit to everybody, but particular individuals as the kings, priests, prophets, uh, judges, the various redeemers who came along from time to time. Joel coming over 830 years before the time of Jesus under the anointing of predictive prophecy said in Joel 2 and 28 and 29, it will come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. The 800 years passed rapidly John Baptist came on the scene in Matthew 3.11 and says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who comes after me is mightier than I, or he's greater than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, or reach down and untie his shoelaces. He shall baptize you with the fiery Holy Spirit. Now this is the first mention of a baptism of the Spirit that we have in the entire Bible. And uh, so that's what it's going to be called, and it's going to be called that all through the New Testament church age. Jesus promised the Comforter in John 14. He would be given to all of his people. Some, one of our ladies said to me on one occasion after hearing me preach, you know, some of our people don't seem to understand that all believers have the Holy Spirit. All believers have the Holy Spirit. That's what makes you a Christian. If a man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. The sinners don't have the Spirit. That's why they're sinners. Christians have the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean they're perfect. They may do some wrong things. That's not the point. They still have the Spirit. They're God's people. And God deals with them accordingly. Hallelujah. <clears throat> but this lady said to me, And to think that all this time I didn't know I had the Holy Spirit. I think it's sad not to know that. Because the Holy Spirit is the comforter God has given to all of his people. No matter how great or how small, it makes no difference. God has given his Holy Spirit. John said in Matthew 3.11, I baptize you with water. Jesus said in Acts 1 and 5, John baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In our seminars across the nation, literally around the world, quite often folks will ask questions, and we invite that. In fact, if you have questions you want to ask, I'd be glad to have you ask them. Why don't you write them out on a piece of paper? Give them to the pastor, give them to me. I'll answer questions every night. Or if something is said that you don't understand, stop me in the aisle here. Anywhere, talk to me. Let's, I'd like to have things cleared up for you before I leave. Amen. Don't walk away not knowing what it's all about. But questions generally come up. One is, well now, chaplain, you know, really, uh, of all the speaking you do about the talking in tongues, really, what is the purpose of all of this anyway? Is it really necessary? 
Well, there are a lot of reasons <clears throat> that we should speak in tongues, but two come to mind quickly. One is, in Acts 1 and 8, he says, you shall receive power after that the Spirit has come upon you. Now, that is really a participle in the Greek text. It should read like this. You shall receive power, the Holy Spirit coming upon you. That can then be interpreted to read when he comes upon you or every time he comes upon you. That's the way it's read. <clears throat> it's not just a once for all thing. It can be a continuous thing. Power for service and endowment for power. And one of the most important things, it seems to me, that in our churches we seldom talk about is that Paul says if one speaks in tongues, he edifies himself. Now, that's a major statement. I am not going into that in depth tonight because I am going into it Wednesday night when I tell you what it does for the mind or the soul or the, or the spirit of man. Don't miss that edification, building oneself up. I'll be going all through that Wednesday night. Now, you won't want to miss that at all. Power for service, the ability to witness for Jesus Christ. Every one of God's people, I believe this, whether or not you speak with tongues, every believer ought to be a witness for Jesus Christ. I believe so. It seems to me that every believer ought to be able sometime, somewhere, someplace, persuade somebody to become a Christian. I believe that. We had an incident in our family just recently. In fact, one of my grandchildren, 22-year-old boy, his father's one of our ministers. The lad got away from God and did his own thing. Finally, God got hold of him. And now this boy, you have to see him, he's a smart boy. He's got a couple of years in college. And uh, he grows a ponytail that long. A lot of us would like to clip that in his sleep, but we didn't dare do it, of course. <clears throat> but God got hold of him. <clears throat> and when God did, I mean God did a number on him. The lad immediately straightened out, moved back home, began going to church. And at the salon where he got his hair taken care of all the time, he walked in one day and says, I want my ponytail cut off. And the people said, what's the matter, pal? Hey, what's happened? He said, God told me to do it. Now, boy, that shakes up the, the world outside when you talk like that. Because they knew this boy to be a boy of the world. And he's talking about God told him. <laughs> not afraid to witness. He's not afraid of anybody. He called the girlfriend he'd been living with and said, I can't do this anymore. I'm saved, living for God. And on the phone, got her converted. Listen, that's what happens when God begins to move. Witnesses for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And that should be the aim of every one of us is to win somebody for Jesus Christ. When this is all over and we all get to heaven, I hope I can look around and see somebody there because I told them. Don't you think so? Sure. Don't want to go single-handed. Take somebody with you. Hallelujah. <clears throat> the ability to witness. The ability to live for Christ. If we say we're Christians, we ought to live like it and we ought to act like it. This has to do with ethics and conduct, of course. The ability to perform for Jesus Christ. Jesus gave us the Great Commission over in Mark when he says, These signs shall follow those who believe. In my name shall I cast out demons, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, when he gave the Great Commission, he's not giving it just to preachers. In other words, in those days, there was no such thing as clergy and laity. They were just the people of God. And, so, and it wasn't just the deacons. It was all of God's people. I have been pastor of several of our churches, and I'm always amazed. I was always amazed. It seemed like every time somebody gets sick, it's 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> then the phone rings, and I don't even know where I am, you know. and uh, Got to kind of get oriented. And I've always, often wished, if they're going to get sick, why don't they let me know about 6 o'clock the night before? But, hey, I got a better idea than that. Call the deacons. <laughs> well, wait, wait a minute. Can't we call one another? Won't God hear your prayers? Of course He will. Don't misunderstand me now. <clears throat> if someone is deathly sick, somebody will let the pastor know, of course. 
I, I've also had the case where somebody in the church got sick and nobody said anything. They laid out three weeks and, done, and it was a lady. The time she got back, she got mad at the pastor and says, I was sick and you didn't come see me. I said, honey, I'm not psychic. Nobody told me. You know, we're supposed to be automatically psychic or something. I don't know what it is. No, you have to call for the elders of the church. I never forced my prayers on anybody. You out there? Sure, I don't want to be presumptuous at all. If you want my prayers, you need to call. Then I'm willing to go, you see. And I'm sure that's so with your pastor. Reasons for being filled with the Spirit that we might have. Power for service. This is an endowment for power that quite often is misunderstood today. Some people think it means a great emotional whirl of some type. Or somebody runs around the building. Now, I have nothing against that. You own the property. You have the right to run around it if you want to, you know. But I don't think that's what is meant by power. And there's one place why one fellow got a great shaking and somebody says, didn't the power come down upon him? Maybe. Maybe he just got the Pentecostal jerks. <laughs> well, that's a possibility. Now, I'm not against that. I think it might do some of us good to get the Pentecostal jerks once in a while. It might help us out a little bit. Yeah, we get so staid and rigid we can't even move anymore. But that's not what power is. That's my point here. It's not emotions. It's not good feelings and all of that, though it certainly might come along. Rather, the power is the ability to witness and to persuade somebody to become a Christian. That's what we're talking about tonight as we deal with this subject of power. And then I'm amazed at some people who have said, well, I'm the silent type. I can't really say much. I think we ought to just live so people can see Jesus in us. Now, isn't that holy and romantic? The only problem with that is it doesn't work. Nobody lives that good anyway. But not only that, the gospel is not written on your forehead. Nobody can look at you and see that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died on the cross. The gospel is a revelation that has to be told from generation to generation. Somebody's got to say it, and somebody's got to hear it. That's always so. It's got to be told. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Elton Trueblood, the great Quaker philosopher, said, There is no such thing as a non-witnessing Christian. That is a contradiction in terms. That means everybody's a witness by the fact you're a Christian. It, you don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to read the book in the Hebrew and the Greek. But you can tell somebody what Jesus Christ means to you, what he's done for you. And that's being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, these silent people, quite often when you get at home with them, you can hear them yell three blocks at the kids anyway. They're not half as silent as you think they are. Now... This thing of power, we have, I think, misunderstood this quite a bit. Anybody who has been to Sunday school in any of our churches for a period of time know that the word for power in Acts 1 and 8 is the word dunamis, from which we get the word dynamite. And man, we have a big deal on the dynamite, the power of God. Wait a minute! Anybody who works with construction or, or who deals with explosives know that dynamite won't do anything unless it's detonated or triggered. You can have a case of dynamite down here and never do anything. Not unless something sets it off. And so here we go with the dunamis, but we've left it there. That's not good enough. Dunamis has got to become energia or flowing energy. Some time ago, <clears throat> Sears and Roebuck had a ad on television, maybe you saw it, about the diehard battery. Now, I got so impressed I went out and bought one. But <laughs> what, what they did was, they, I, I think it had five or six cars in a parking lot. It's raining. The lights are on. All the cars are hooked up to one battery. And, of course, the narrator says, will the die-hard battery start the five cars? I'll tell you one thing, Sears knew it would before they run that ad. <clears throat> and they turned the keys. Yep, every car started. Now, that wasn't miraculous. The battery had the power before they turned the keys on. 
but the engines did not run until they turned the keys on. And that's where we are. We've got the battery, we're hooked up, but some of us haven't turned the keys on yet. Turn the keys on, see what'll happen. Get the potential energy, the dynamis. It's got to become flowing energy. Energia. It's got to go through the line, go down to the engine, start the engine, put the thing in the transmission, down to the wheels, and move the machine out. So nothing's going to happen, honey, till you turn the keys on. Then you'll see something take place here. <coughs> Dunamis must become energia. Well, at Pentecost, there were probably 120 people there. Now, it's an amazing thing. Some people, particularly among the Church of Christ, people of the Nazarenes, maybe, Baptists, some of them maybe, uh, will say, well, at Pentecost, only the 12 were there. Have you ever heard that one? Now, don't get mad at them. It just means they can't read. If you show them how to read, they're pretty good people. I was, so, I was in Bethel, Temp Bethel Church, San Jose, many years ago when Dr. Keyes was a pastor. Full house, big church. And I had said something like this about the Church of Christ people, and incidentally, I'm not mad at them. I love them. They just don't know how to read all of them. You got to have to help them. And I had told this, and I gave an invitation that night. About 70 people got up and came forward to receive the baptism of the Spirit. Dr. Keyes had us in a very large prayer room. And it was such a group and unorganized, I couldn't get any orders. I said, people, throw up your hands and begin to worship God. Many of you will get the baptism, whether or not I lay hands on you. And they did begin just receiving all over the place. Toward the end of that, a little elderly man and his wife approached me, very quietly said, Chaplain, would you lay hands on us to receive the baptism of the Spirit? I said, of course I would. I lay hands on the little gentleman. He spoke in tongues, and his wife did. We had friends in the church who told us the next Wednesday night, he took about 25 minutes after, out of Dr. Keyes' time to tell the Assembly of God people how good the baptism of the Holy Spirit was. He and his wife belonged to the Church of Christ. <laughs> Marvelous. We just help them read and understand the Scriptures, you know. Of course, people who say that miss it on three counts. If you say the 12 are there, that's not correct because only the 11 wouldn't be, would be there. Judas was not there. Not only that, to fulfill the prophecy of Joel, there's got to be some handmaidens there. Some women have to be there. And it says Mary, the mother of Jesus, and a few more of those were there. And of course, they miss it on the third count when it says about 120 were there. So I mean, how definite can you get well, they're there, and incidentally, this was a praise meeting, not a begging meeting. I'm amazed how many people think they're going to twist the arm of God and make God do something. No, you're not. He is a sovereign God after all said and done. Are you out there? Say amen. 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 And this is not a, not a tearing meeting. Oh, no, 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 no. Get out of that. It's a worship service. This is a harvest festival. Yes. They've come to have a good time. God knows that life gets so dreary and so boring and so burdensome. There's got to be a party once in a while if you're going to make it through. That's why I like to go to parties. It makes up for the bad times. Sure. Otherwise, if you go stick in your hole all by yourself, you pretty well get depressed. But you go out and see people, have a drink, a cup of coffee, eat a couple of donuts, have a good time. Hey, that brings you out of a lot of things, you know. Hey, man, and that's what they were doing, having a grand time. No introspection, no looking inside to see what's the matter with them. That's for Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That's when you search your heart, you know. And so they were having a grand time doing this. You know, my wife and I, some of you don't know this, my wife and I have ten children. Five boys and five girls. Now, we've been having a party. Fine young people. Of course, they're all going from home now. But it's a very close family. Anytime any two or three of us get together, we have a party. We just simply love to eat. You can tell that. And we love each other. I mean, we have a good time just because we like to. So about five or six of us met in Hong Kong several years ago. We had a party for two weeks. <laughs> I'll never forget when I retired from the Navy, I was down at Muffet Field Naval Air Station, and uh, some of the children were still home. And uh, on one occasion, uh, one of the girls who was in college came home for a few days. She and a, one of our 
girls, a high school senior, had dates with sailors, one Christian sailors one night, going out and playing miniature golf. And the girls said to us, Mom and Daddy, do you want to go play with us? Our teenagers have always invited us to go with them wherever they went. I think that's marvelous. On this particular occasion, I said, no, nah, you guys go ahead. We don't want to go. So the sailors picked them up and off they went. <clears throat> After about 15 minutes, my wife says to me, why don't we go down there and play with them? Oh, okay. Yeah. So we got our shoes on, got in the car, went down there, found the golf course, and went out and paid our dues, got our club, walked out on the course. And when we got out there, now here's the girl, a college girl and a senior in high school. When they saw us, they come running and shouting, Mom and Daddy, Mom and Daddy. And I mean, we're hugging and kissing and patting each other and rubbing each other. We're having a big time. The sailors came running up and said, How long since it's been since y'all saw each other? <laughs> the girls looked at him and said, 45 minutes. <laughs> We just simply love to have a good time, that's all. Well, my friends, life is too short not to have a good time. There's enough bad times, but you don't want to think on that. Think on the good things, whatsoever is good and pure, good report. Have a party, hallelujah. Have a party and enjoy what you can. <clears throat> Pray, we need more celebration. I have built some of the largest religious programs in the United States serving coffee and donuts. People love coffee and donuts. Donuts go down, coffee will wash down anything, and have a good time, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that's the way that it was. So they were worshiping and praising God. No preaching going. They weren't preaching the gospel in tongues. They were worshiping and glorifying God here. Hallelujah. And this was not, some people think that God had 120 people locked up in a little room, the upper room. I've been in the upper room. It won't hold 120 people. They think God had 120 people up there. He is elite. He's going to do a number on his people. No, he wasn't going to do any such thing. This is the day of Pentecost. This is going to be a cosmic event. The whole world is going to know there's a God in heaven. Remember, 50 days before this, Pente means 50, 50 days after Passover. At Passover, down in the temple area, the curtain in the temple was rent from top to bottom. And the curtain was three feet thick. No man could do it. God did it to show Israel that the Holy of Holies has been opened up. Now we all go into the Holy of Holies and worship God. Hallelujah. This is still the temple area when the fire... Fr in fact, one man wrote a novel based on truth. And he said when the fire fell in Jerusalem, you could see the flash as far away as Rome. This is a cosmic event. The world's going to know that there's a God in heaven. Hallelujah. Now you have an amazing thing here. <clears throat> all these who received the baptism and spoke in tongues were all Galileans. That means they were the laboring force. That is the fishermen, the carpenters, this type people. They were not the schooled people. It doesn't mean they were ignorant. It just means they were not schooled. They were the laboring class of people. And uh, wouldn't you have thought somebody would have said, you know, this is simply marvelous. Here's these people who have never been to school. They're talking languages. We understand them ourselves. Wouldn't you have thought somebody would have said that? But they didn't. You've always got a wise guy in every crowd, generally. And when they didn't understand it, one guy says, these people are all drunk. Now, that's an amazing assessment of the situation, isn't it? You know what the implication of that is? If you want to learn a foreign language, go get drunk. Now, I don't go out and say the chaplain said it. Somebody said I did that once. No. I just said that's the implication of that kind of talking. <laughs> it's amazing. I served in the United States Navy for 28 years. I've seen Marines and sailors get drunk, and when they did, they did not talk in tongues. <laughs> they said some other things. <laughs> But there's something in, in the New Testament, particularly the book of Acts, a preacher cannot preach unless something happens to give him a reason to preach. So God lets this guy jump up and say, oh, these people are all drunk. Who responded that day? The Apostle Peter. The man who had denied the Christ so miserably when it says he pulled a curse down upon himself that night when he said, I don't know him. And went out and wept bitterly. 
In fact, Peter would not have been here had he not had a special invitation. For on the resurrection morning, Jesus said to the women, Go tell my disciples and Peter, I go before you into Galilee. Tell you why. So Peter had a special invitation. That's why he's there. But when this guy says they're all drunk, Peter can't even take that. And he's the guy that responds to the situation when he, it says here in Acts 2, uh, 14. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Now, when he said the third hour of the day, he said three things. The third hour of the day is nine o'clock in the morning. When he said it's the third hour of the day, note this. On the feast days, the fast was not broken until 10 o'clock. They would not be drinking at 9. The Jews knew this. Not only that, the temple service took place at 9 o'clock. The Jews would not be out eating and drinking. They'd be in the temple service or some such. Not only that, and the Jews knew that. Not only that, the Jews did not drink wine unless they ate flesh, and they did not eat flesh for breakfast. And the Jews knew this. So when they said it's 9 o'clock in the morning, he said all of that. And they re realized what he said. But this is that which was spoken through the prophet Joel. And as you'll come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out on those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Now, <clears throat> while he's got the group together, now he's going to preach to them. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up. Now, wait a minute. Let me pause. That is the gospel in a nutshell right there. You killed him, God raised him. That's the primitive gospel all through the book of Acts. You killed him. He was dead and buried, raised the third day. That's the primitive gospel. Now, once a person has heard that, he then becomes responsible for his own soul salvation. God doesn't have to tell you again. You're accountable, you see. All right. <clears throat> This Jesus is God raised up for over all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth with this which you now see and hear. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in the heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostle, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now when they heard this, what did they hear? They were told that the one whom they had crucified is indeed the Lord and Christ. Which means, and they understood this, if that be true, and it is, that means we're going to meet him again at a judgment day. What shall we do? Something's got to be done. Peter says, repent. In other words, become a follower of the one whom you crucified. That's all. And that's all repentance means. All it means is you were doing this, now do this. That's all. You once despised Jesus, now love you. That's all it means. The one you did not follow, now follow him. That's all it means. And that's repentance. Hallelujah. And so, uh, boy, you talk about a sermon. 3,000 people are converted. 3,000 people are baptized with the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people are baptized in water. And 3,000 people join the church. That is what you call instant church. I get amazed at people today. They'll get saved, or healed, or filled. And then you talk about church members of the I don't think you need to go to church to be saved. Or, How did you ever decide that? Who told you that? That's not the Bible like that. 
Yeah, you know who it is that says you don't have to go to church to be a Christian? You know who says that? It's the people who don't go to church. The people who love God go to church. Because that's where you meet God's people. That's where you hear the word of God preached. That's where your faith is increased. That's where you're healed or saved or filled. Whatever you need, that's where it is. If I were not preaching tonight, I ought to be in church anyway. Be with God's people. Hallelujah. I don't know that I will ever pastor another church. It certainly is not in my plans. Of course, God could decide a lot of things, but it's not in my plans anyway. But if I ever did, the day I arrived, I would tell the board, fill the baptistry. Now, if a person gets saved on Sunday morning, I will dunk him or her then. And as they come out of the tank, I'll lay hands on them, have them talking in tongues as they come out of the tank. Send them out of the church dripping wet and talking in tongues. When they get to the door, a deacon will hand the card and say, Sign this, you have joined the church. <laughs> You won't, the way we do it, though, you get them saved and you wait six months to get them baptized. By that time, you lost them anyway, and or they moved, and then we're going to have a tarry beat and get them by that time they quit anyway. That's our problem. No, get it all to them the first thing out. Hallelujah. Then you probably keep, we'll probably keep more if we did it just like that. Well, all right. I'll show you how this works. Of course, my thesis is. People could speak in tongues when they got saved if they knew it or if they went all out for Christ when they made that decision. I was <clears throat> ministering in a small church some years ago. I was still in the Navy. I was ministering in a small church near the Long Beach Naval Shipyards. I was a guest just for the day and I preached a Sunday morning and a Sunday night. Sunday morning I did not give an invitation, but Sunday night I did. On Sunday evening when I gave the invitation, a sailor and an elderly man got up and came forward to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, the sailor was a Catholic lad. These were the days before the Catholics would go anywhere, you know, but their own church. And I didn't know that he was Catholic. And I had made the statement that night, tonight I will lay hands on anybody who wants to receive the baptism of the Spirit. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care how you're living. Just tell me you love Jesus. You know, that's pretty strong for some people. Some of our people can't take that. I didn't realize it for a while. But the sailor believed me. <clears throat> now, I didn't know a thing about the sailor. I didn't know he was a Catholic. I didn't know he was not saved. And I found out later the only reason he was in church that night was he was going with a girl in the church, and her mother says, you got to go to church. And, of course, the sailor wanted to be with a girl, so he went to church. <clears throat> now, it happened to be that the sailor believed what I said. And so they came forth. The man and the sailor both came forth. And in that church, the podium was level with the main floor. I could just reach over and lay hands on. And so when they came forward, now here see a little tiny church, maybe 20, 25 people out that night, little church. Now, when they came forward, there's a lady sitting on the back row who was afraid the evangelist was going to do something he ought not do. He's going to lay hands on on an unsaved Catholic. And it worried her because she knew that I didn't know. Sitting on the back row of that little church, she cupped her hands and in a hoarse whisper that you could hear all over the little old church, she speaks out about the sailor, he's not even saved. Well, I got the word the sailor's not saved. In fact, the whole church got the word the sailor's not saved. The only person that didn't bother was the sailor. Being a Catholic, he didn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> I think it's marvelous. <laughs> and, she, and he didn't know she's talking about him. So here he comes and there he stands, you know. I looked at the sailor. I was in the uniform of a Navy commander that night, and the sailor was in a sailor uniform. He was standing rigidly at attention like he was scared to death. I looked at that sailor, I said, Son, would you receive the Holy Spirit when I lay hands on you? He says, Yes, sir. I reached over and laid hands on that Catholic lad. I said, Then receive the Holy Spirit. He was already standing rigidly at attention. When I laid hands on him, he closed his eyes very tightly like he was in excruciating pain and ducked his head. So we just watched. All of a sudden, 
He threw his head up, eyes wide open. He threw his hands up into heaven and he cried out to God, save me, save me, and began talking in tongues right in front of the church. Give God a hand. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. I didn't even tell him anything. He just did it. Save me, save me. He starts talking in tongues. I tell you, you can tell he's saved when he does that. <laughs> Praise God forever. That boy will never know the joys of tarrying. <laughs> you out there? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I was over in uh, Montclair, California some time ago. Now, that seems to be near the hub of the Claremont Colleges, very prestigious area there. <clears throat> and uh, we have a good church there, and I was preaching. On a Sunday night, a stranger came in the group, a lady, a middle-aged lady. Nobody knew her. But she was there that night, and when I gave an invitation for those who wanted to receive the Spirit, this lady got up, very stately lady, uh, dressed in impeccably tailored suit, woman's suit. Middle-aged lady got up and in a very stately manner walked down the middle aisle. When she got to the front row of seats, she just raised her hands and started talking in tongues. I went down to make myself known to her. I found her. She was Dr. Dorothy Merritt, a Ph.D. from the University of Laverne. Highly educated. She simply believed what I said and came down and entered in just that easily. Hallelujah. This is the way it works. <coughs> if you keep it simple, simply believe God, difficulties begin to disappear, you see. Well, we need to understand that. Now, just for a few moments, i uh, take you over what I call some practical factors, things we found out from time to time about people have some bad ideas or wrong ideas about what God will do when they get filled with the Spirit. If you've been in Pentecost any length of time, you've probably heard all kinds of tales. And the longer you've been in, the worse it gets. Yeah. And you'll find they got you standing on your head to get the baptism. You know, I mean, amazing what happened. In fact, I had that happen one night. I preached in a church, and a man, one of the deacons, got the baptism. I was out talking to somebody. Here's a guy standing on his head on the platform. I said, what's he doing? <laughs> he came down, and I said, hey, what are you doing up there? He said, I told God that he, if he'd give me the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'd stand on my head in front of the church. <laughs> I thought he was doing it. <laughs> he was keeping his promise to God. <laughs> <coughs> now, that didn't bring the baptism, you know. Hallelujah. So the days of tearing are over. But some people get some odd ideas. I picked up one of my books one time. I was reading about a prayer meeting. Some ladies were having sometime, somewhere. Elderly ladies. And you know, in the old days, you used to have people lie on the floor. Remember that? You used to have people lie on the floor to get the baptism. How many remember that? Remember that? You remember that? Yeah. I don't know why we did it, but that's the way you did it then. <laughs> so uh, this little lady... One lady thought she was about to receive the baptism. She says, hang on, sister, you're about to get it. The little, little lady opened her eyes big and wide and says, no, I ain't. <laughs> she says, because I ain't blacked out yet. <laughs> she thought you had to black out. That's a terrible thought, isn't it? I have blacked out twice in my life. I was sick both times. I woke up in the hospital one time, hoping that. So I don't go for the blackout routine at all. You can understand that. Uh, no, not for me. <laughs> I was in one of our very large churches, Faith down in La Mesa. They run three or 4,000 people. A young man came down to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's speaking in tongues. You know, I believe some people have the baptism and don't know it. This man, I heard him speaking in tongues. I said, thank God, brother, you have it. He says, you know what? I said, no. He says, I've been doing this for over a month and didn't know it. <laughs> Here he was talking to him, didn't know he had the baptism. He told me the rest of the story later. <clears throat> he said, you know what I thought? No, nope, you never know until they tell you. I said, what? He said, I thought when I would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would lift me off the floor 12 feet and I would go into orbit talking in tongues. <laughs> now that's high-powered stuff. <laughs> now, where do people get these ideas? Nobody knows. But strange ideas just seem to sift in. 
But the problem is, then we're going to hold God responsible to do something he's not going to do. And because he doesn't do it, we don't get the baptism because we think he's supposed to. Get all of anything out of your head. You're only supposed to do one thing, and that's talk in tongues. That's all. That's all you're supposed to do. If you turn cartwheels, that'll be a bonus. All right. <clears throat> all right. Let's see where I am in the inspired notes here. Now, let's see. <clears throat> Some people say you'll get the joy. You might, you might not. The Bible doesn't say that. Some people do get hilarious. Some people simply calmly, coolly speak in tongues. In fact, the British have a word for this, you know. Of course, they've been around longer than we have. Over there, if somebody speaks in tongues, you know, gets real emotional, they say he got hot tongues. If they just real calmly speak in tongues, they say he got cool tongues. I think they, I think they understand something. We're not all identical emotionally. No. Some people are very hilarious by nature. Some you couldn't move with a stick. You know, we're not all the same. Then don't expect or don't compare your experience with somebody else's. Let God be God. You do what you do. And let everybody else do what they do. Don't compare at all. Hallelujah. Well, I analyze these things just so people can kind of get an understanding of uh, what goes on here. So tongues, not feelings, not joy, are the evidence of receiving the baptism of the Spirit. Hallelujah. So when Hansel laid on, we saw this this morning. People's lips generally begin to tremble. We call this stammering lips in Isaiah 28 and 11. At that, here's, the, here's the secret. At that moment, when hands are laid on, your lips begin to tremble. If at that moment you would open your mouth and speak out and not hinder it and not speak English or any acquired language, you'd be speaking in tongues in a matter of moments. This is simply the way it is. Hallelujah. We in the Western church have a problem in that we are so plagued, sophisticated, we can't see straight. Even ignorant people over here are sophisticated. You know what I had a woman say to me one time? I had a prayer line. She came down for prayer. I said, I'm, what can I do for you, sister? I want to pray God delivers me from pride. I looked at her. She was kind of a common woman. I says, pride, what are you proud of? I don't know. I'm just proud. I said, well, have you got a million dollars? Are you a college graduate? No. I said, what are you proud of? I don't know. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. <laughs> but that's the way we Americans are. I've been in the Far East. You've been in the Far East. You can deal with those people. They're very humble people. They'll, they'll believe what you tell them. You can say them to the bedroom. I've, I've done in San Diego. They've served in San Diego. I've seen people lay hands on foreign admirals, and they get the baptism. No problem. But we're so uptight and strung so high, we can't even see straight. We need to get off of some of that. Hallelujah. All right. So simple, you'll think you're doing it all by yourself, for you have the power to do it or the power not to do it. It is a matter of the will. The apostles said in 1 Corinthians 14, 32, the spirit of prophets is subject to prophets. Now, if you understand 1 Corinthians 14, that is a control chapter. The prophet can prophesy when he wants to or he can seize and desist when he wants to because he's in control of his own spirit. This principle holds for all the verbal or oral gifts because you're in control of your spirit. God does not make you do something you don't want to do. You have to want to do it. Hallelujah. Well, let's move on. <clears throat> in fact, I was in Newport, Rhode Island some time ago. And uh, I met one of our Coast Guard sailors, Sunday God boy, young married boy. Uh, we used to have the yacht races in Newport before the Aussies took the cup, you remember, and uh, off of Newport. And the Coast Guard sent their square rigger ship, the Eagle, up there to monitor the races. This boy was a ship's cook on that ship. I met him. He was homesick. He was lonely. He missed his wife and baby. I took him home. Mrs. Lindsay got a good meal for him. Then he says to me, can we talk about the Holy Spirit? I said, yeah. So we're in a room talking. He said, if I could just talk in tongues again, I'd feel so good. I said, do you have the baptism of the Spirit? Oh, yeah, I got the baptism. I said, well, you can talk in tongues any time you want to. He says, oh, no, I can't. How is this? I can only talk in tongues when the power gets turned on, he says. I said, well, how do you turn the power? He says, that's what I don't know. I said, oh, okay, I'll show you how to turn the power on. <laughs> I said, I'm going to count three. We're sitting together. I'm going to count three. When I count three and say, go, throw your hands up with them talking tongues. He says, I can't do it. 
I said, will you try? Yeah. Get ready. One, two, three, go! And we're both talking in tongues. He's talking in tongues, so am I. After a moment, I stopped him. I could see he was surprised. He says, I didn't know I could do that. I said, sure, you can do it. We're going to do it again. Get ready. One, two, three, go! I've never seen it done in the Bible like that, but it worked. He says, I didn't know I could do it. Sure. I says, you can talk in tongues any time you want to. I said, now let me give you a hint. When you go back down to the ship, don't talk in tongues in front of the crew. They might throw you over the side. <laughs> but in your privacy, in your workspace, and particularly at home in the church, practice your prayer language. He says, okay. Well, that was in the fall of a year. That Christmas, I got a Christmas card from him. Dear Chaplain, Merry Christmas, so, so, so. Then he says, since I met you and found I can talk in tongues anytime I want to, I do. He says, now the Lord has given me five or six different languages I pray in. Divers kinds of tongues, various kinds of tongues. He, that's the secret. You develop the thing as you put it into practice. Hallelujah. Now, this is the way it is. Let me go back to the Battle of the Coral Sea. I'll never forget. I was just a lad. I joined the Navy right out of high school. I was an enlisted musician for eight years, Navy bandsman for eight years. Then I went out eight years, went to school, college seminary, come back, did another 20 years as a Navy chaplain. But in my first time in, I was in USS Yorktown. And... Pearl Harbor had been bombed, you know that, and then we're out to the war. We get down into the month of May, we're down into, into, into the Coral Sea, which is off the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. The Japanese fleet is coming south to either attack or invade Australia, it was believed, and we were to interdict the fleet. And so, now, some of you young people, this will sound amazing, in those days we did not have radar, hadn't been invented yet. Everything was done visually. And uh, naval battles don't take long. It's jockeying for position that takes time. You hope you get the drop on the other guy, you know, that's the hope. And so on the night of May 7th, our scouting planes had been out looking for the fleet. The last man out made his turn to come back when on his horizon, he saw a Japanese aircraft carrier and he radioed back to the ship. Well, now we knew that tomorrow was going to be the battle. The ships, we knew where each other was or at that time. And so <clears throat> the time came then, <coughs> and uh, I was a telephone walker, talker. You know, Navy musicians do not sit and play a concert and play near my God to thee when the ship's going down. <laughs> you got more things to do than that. We have different jobs. I was a telephone talker for a repair party. I was to relay messages back and forth from the battle station to our repair party officer. And so having the phones on, I could hear what was going on on top side because I had all that in my phones. And now in those days, we did not have jet aircraft either, all propeller aircraft, you remember. And, uh, but I remember hearing the man on the phone on the bridge say, enemy aircraft approaching 100 miles. Enemy aircraft approaching 75 miles. Enemy aircraft approaching 50 miles, 25 miles. Stand by for air attack. Kaboom. Well, they dropped several bombs, but we only got one bomb hit. But it was an armor-piercing shell that ripped through five decks before it exploded. And when it did, it gutted 30 compartments and killed about 60 or 70 men just blasted them up against the bulkheads, against the walls, you know. I was in the compartment just after, just after of that. And the watertight door sprung up and a man fell through, blood just coming from his face. He yelled, my God, my God, and dropped to the deck. We thought he was dead. That day, they put the dead bodies that they could get together and simply lined them up on the mess decks. That day, I saw big men cry. A good man cry, who saw some of their shipmates they've known for years lying there in that heap, you know. And then the compartment ahead of us, actually the shell had torn the deck out from beam to beam. I mean, the whole section had been torn out. The ship is vulnerable to breaking up, because that was a main, a main deck. 
And all we, all they did was put planking across it so we could walk back and forth across it, across that great gaping hole. Now, if you've ever burnt, ever smelt burnt flesh, that's the most horrible odor you can smell. And it was a stench which we could not get away from. And uh, so after that, then, of course, we're going to make our way back to Pearl Harbor. Now, with us in the Coral Sea was USS Lexington, another one of our aircraft carriers. While we received one bomb hit, Lexington had been bombed and torpedoed. Lexington was a fire from stem to stern. By the time they thought they could contain the explosions, another would break out, and finally the commanding officer said, abandon ship. They couldn't save the ship. They didn't believe. <clears throat> and so we saw a Navy cruiser come up behind the Lexington, and it uh, seemed to be pretty level with the flight deck. By that time, men just walked off the flight deck onto the cruiser. Now, some were already over the side in the water, uh, having gone over the side at the sound of abandoned ship. Now, one man who had gone over the side was a photographer, photographer's mate. The man had been badly burned in an explosion. And uh, he'd been to the sick bay. They had treated him for shock and for pain. And they were going to keep him there until the commanding officer said abandon ship. Then he simply had to go. And he went over the side. He's in the water struggling for his life. In great pain and in shock, strength almost gone. And when a ship is sinking, you try to get away from it because if it goes down, it pulls you with it. So you try to get away from the ship. And this man was trying to get away. But his strength is gone. He simply came to the place that he'd given up and decided he would simply drown and go with the ship. He'd made that decision. Now, at that precise hour, what's Australia, 8,000 miles from here maybe, something like 8 or 10 maybe, 3,000 miles on over on the east coast, this man had a spirit-filled sister. In fact, she's the one who told me the story. And of course, in those days, they did not let the media know what was going on because we couldn't let the, could not let the enemy know what damage they had caused us. She knew nothing of the battle. Nobody did. She knew nothing of her brother's terrible ordeal at that moment. She felt an awful burden to pray, not knowing what for. You know, Paul said, often we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us. She simply went to prayer because she had that great burden of prayer. And not knowing what to pray for, she began to pray in the Spirit. Paul said in Ephesians 6.18, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. She went to prayer and agonized and interceded, praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit, not knowing what for. This went on for some time. And finally the moment came she felt a strange release. What we used to call praying through. God gave victory. The burden's lifted. Whatever it was, there's been an answer granted. And when her brother came home, they compared notes later. And at the time she felt the great release and felt that God had answered prayer, her brother being in the water, when he had decided to quit and simply give up his life, he heard the Holy Spirit say, try again. And he made one more effort and got away from the ship. Amazing how God, you know, God's communication doesn't break down. Oh, glory to God. Maybe we can't communicate, but God can. God can communicate with his sister. The sister can communicate with God about the problem, not knowing intellectually what it was, but in the spirit doing the will of God. God reaches down and touches this man, says, try again. The man tries again and is saved. Hallelujah. Marvelous what God can do when, if we could only learn to pray and do these things that God would have us do. God has his own communication system. USS Lexington was sunk that day. And the fact of the matter is, we sunk the ship ourselves because it was going down too slow, making a big fire at night, and we could not get distance from her. We'd be a target, so we torpedoed the ship ourselves to get rid of the fire. But sister's prayer saved the boy that day because she could pray in the Spirit. This is one reason that Mrs. Lindsay and I keep traveling like we do to get people filled with the Spirit so they can pray. 
so they can talk to God, so they can have communication. This is not just a nice thing to do, honey. This is a needful thing to do. Tomorrow night, I'm going to tell you about the sinking of USS Yorktown. I was on that ship when it was bombed and ripped and torpedoed. I'll tell you the story tomorrow night. Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for your goodness and mercy. Let's raise our hands and give the Lord thanks, will you? Hallelujah. 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 Thank you.